11 here, we're getting close to the end of chapter 19. Here we're going to talk about, you know, what it is that causes perfusion of your tissues from capillary. So that involves this exchange of fluids and solutes between the blood passing through the capillaries and the surrounding tissue fluids. That's going to be tissue perfusion. And of course that is really the goal of your cardiovascular system is to make sure that your body tissue uh, gets perfused. All right, and so as I already mentioned, tissue perfusion is involved in the delivery of O2 and nutrients and removal of the waste that are generated by your tissue cells. And your tissues generate many different kinds of wastes. You know, a key one though is good old carbon dioxide, which is a waste product of the cellular respiration processes that are used for making ATP. This is also involved in the lungs. It's involved in the gas exchange. So the capillaries in the lungs the, uh, have to exchange gases with the air in the little tiny air sacs in the lungs. And we'll cover more of that when we get to the, um, when we study the respiratory system a little bit later during the semester. A couple of other special cases of tissue perfusion in your uh, digestive tract. The little tiny capillaries that are passing through the walls of your uh, small intestine have to absorb nutrients that you're taking in from your diet, and that'll be uh, a topic when we get to Unit 4. And then finally, you have a special cases of special cases of tissue perfusion in the kidneys that are involved in, uh, in um, urine formation. All right, so what's going to drive all of this? The, it's going to be pressure changes across the capillary bed, and we have to ensure that our rate of flow, the blood flow through these uh, capillaries, is correct to make sure that tissues get perfused properly. This is a pretty little interesting diagram in your textbook figure 19.13 and it's showing you, it's making a comparison. Blood flow throughout your body at rest versus when you are exercising strenuously. And remember blood flow is given in milliliters per minute. So on average, in an average adult, the systemic circulation, the blood flow throughout all of your uh, systemic tissues is about 5,800 milliliters per minute. And you can see, you know, how that is divided up over here. And then over here, if you're exercising vigorously, that increases, you know, about threefold, 17,500 milliliters per minute. And it's interesting to see there when you're exercising, it's not a surprise that your skeletal muscles receive about 1,200 milliliters of blood per minute when you're at rest, but that's going to increase up to about 12,500 milliliters per minute when you are uh, exercising the surface of the skin. That helps you radiate heat outward and uh, helps cool your body off. So that's not a surprise either. That's an interesting little diagram to take a look at. All right, so blood flow to tissues. How is this regulated? We have to control this. Um, there are automatic adjustments to blood flow that are made, and it depends on the needs of the tissues. So some of these things can happen automatically. And as we've talked about before, you do not have blood flowing into all of your capillaries at any given time. There's no way that that could happen. You don't have enough blood supply to make that happen. And um, so, your arterioles that lead to particular capillary beds um, will dilate if you need increased blood flow into capillaries. Um, remember the precapillary sphincters we looked at before? Those are little tiny rings of smooth muscle that surround the entrances to capillaries and those can close off if you don't need um, oxygen gas delivered to the tissues served by those capillaries and they will open up uh, when you do. So the things that regulate those processes, declining tissue O2, so as oxygen levels drop you are going to open up those precapillary sphincters, you're going to dilate the arterioles nearby, that'll increase blood flow. Also when um, substance, substances that indicate lots and lots and lots of metabolism 
going on in active tissues, things like uh, an increase in hydrogen ion concentration. That's a remember increased hydrogen ion concentrations in your tissues are reflective of a lowering pH. More hydrogen ions around means body fluids are becoming more acidic and that actually lowers your pH value. Those have a, uh, a lowered pH means an increase in acidity or an increase in hydrogen ion concentration. So those types of things indicate um, metabolically active tissues, tissue fluids become more acidic uh, due to increased activity, increased wastes being generated. Also there are signaling molecules, adenosine and prostaglandins are released from metabolically active tissues um, or tissues that are experiencing injury or inflammation. Those types of things will also increase blood flow to an area to help with injury repair and fighting infections. Let's talk about blood flow to the brain for a moment because the brain, as you guys know, the brain is sort of, sort of, sort of critical. And um, um, you have to be extremely careful about blood flow to the brain and making sure that it, uh, that it is controlled very well. If mean arterial pressure, that's your average arterial pressure, drops below 60 millimeters of mercury, that's pretty low blood pressure. That can cause syncope, which is another name for fainting because you're cutting off, the, you're not getting adequate oxygen gas to the neurons in the brain. Lowered brain function is going to cause you to faint. On the flip side, if your mean arterial pressure rises above 160, you can develop cerebral edema. And that's going to be because at higher blood pressures, so imagine you've got blood pressing up against the walls of blood vessels and capillaries. Now even though we have the blood-brain barrier, the capillaries in the brain are not quite as leaky as they are in other parts of the body. They still have to allow fluids and solutes and things to pass out into the tissues of the brain. So when, when arterial pressures rise above 160, mean arterial pressure, you have increased pressure in your brain capillaries and that's going to squeeze too much fluid out of the blood vessels and into the surrounding tissue and that can lead to cerebral edema, swelling of the cerebrum, which is not a good thing. You guys know you don't have a lot of extra space to accommodate a, a swelling brain and so that can actually be fatal if it's uh, not controlled. All right, so we have to be, the body has to maintain blood flow to the brain very, very careful. The brain is not, the, the neurons in the brain are intolerant of ischemia. Remember, ischemia refers to a cutoff in oxygen supply to tissues. So tissues are experiencing hypoxia when that is occurring. So you need about 750 milliliters per minute of blood flow to the brain. If you go back and look at that diagram I was just showing you at rest versus exercise, blood flow to the brain stays pretty con constant around 750 milliliters per minute no matter you know what type of activities you're involved in. Okay, um, some metabolic controls that occur. If, uh, <clears throat> if you have decreased pH due to increased carbon dioxide, um, blood vessels will dilate and supply more blood to the brain. That will increase some blood flow. And again, all right, increased CO2, you know, why is this happening? You have increased CO2, you have more cellular respiration taking place. And so that is uh, an increase in CO2 is indicating increased metabolic activity. So you're going to need to increase blood flow to help support that increased metabolic activity. Um, increased CO2, CO2 functions as an acid in body fluids, which again, we'll study that um, in more detail at the end of the semester. But um, that will lower pH. Increase in CO2 lowers pH in our body fluids. Let's see. Hang on here. Okay. 
there also are some um, automatic what are called myogenic controls that take place in the brain and we'll have to kind of walk through these a little bit carefully because they can be confusing when you first uh, think about them. If you have a decreased mean arterial pressure, all right, so if you have a lowered blood pressure, um, not as much blood, the blood flow to the brain is slowing down, so your cerebral blood vessels will actually dilate. Now, I know we've learned that dilating blood vessels would cause blood pressure to lower even more, but another thing that dilating blood vessels will do is increase blood flow. That should make sense. A constricted blood vessel, you're going to have less blood flow to the tissue locations downstream of that blood vessel. If you dilate it, you're going to have increased blood flow. So that makes sense when you think about it in that context. If your mean arterial blood pressure has dropped, you're not having, getting as much blood circulating to the brain. So a way to counteract that is to increase your cerebral blood vessels to allow more blood to, uh, to flow through the blood vessels. The opposite will occur if you have increased mean arterial pressure, which that can occur, you know, like when you're exercising vigorously. And um, because blood is flowing very quickly through blood vessels, your cerebral blood vessels will actually constrict to help uh, reduce some of that flow to the brain, and that helps you maintain a constant blood flow of about 750 milliliters per minute to the brain. Now imagine if that didn't work that way and you were exercising really vigorously and those cerebral blood vessels stayed at their normal diameter. They didn't constrict as your blood pressure went up due to exercise. Um, that could increase the, the increased blood pressure in your cerebral blood vessels, could squeeze too much fluid out of those blood vessels and into the surrounding tissues and that could cause cerebral edema. So if that didn't work that way, we would be more prone to our brain swelling every time that we, every time we exercise vigorously. Okay, so that's a little bit about controlling blood flow. In the next video lecture, we're actually going to get down to the level of what's going on um, as capillaries exchange gases and nutrients between tissues and pick up waste. We'll talk about that in lecture 12.